Uh, I'd like to start the second session of the day. So our uh, first speaker, we're happy to have Laurus Turlasius uh, tell us about charged black holes and near ADS2 holography. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so I'd like to start to uh, thank the organizers and Johanna for uh, this great meeting. And uh, I also want to thank my uh, friends at Stanford for uh, a very enjoyable collaboration, uh, an ongoing collaboration. We're not quite uh, finished, but I am optimistic, so I put an eight there on the, uh, on the uh, date that it'll show up. Okay, <clears throat> so what I'm gonna talk about today is um, a rather simple system. So the motivation was to explore these various uh, conjectures <laughs> that help? Okay. So we wanted to, no, I don't know. Ah, stay away from the speaker, okay. No problem. Um, so we wanted to um, explore these various, um, try that side, okay. All right. Um, okay, right, motivation. Um, so there are these conjectures that have been made about <clears throat> a very simple uh, way to compute in the bulk, on the bulk gravity side, um, um, properties or, or basically um, variables that behave as you would expect the uh, quantum complexity of a chaotic uh, system and uh, which is the, um, so basically this is a, um, on the one hand it goes by the uh, complexity as volume conjecture and then this was refined to a complexity as action in a simple setting, and I'll go into a little bit uh, uh, more sort of how we define that in the simplified context. And the context that I'm going to study this in is a model that has been uh, getting a lot of attention recently, uh, mostly because it is, uh, well, partly because it's simple, but mostly because it has some interesting properties. In particular, it has uh, some broken conformal symmetry that means that implies that the low energy dynamics is, is governed by a rather universal, um, uh, <clears throat> it's rather universal, it's governed by a simple effective action that involves a Schwarzschild derivative. Uh, and um, the same broken symmetry is also realized in the uh, sashtev kitaev model that has also been uh, the focus of a lot of effort. And um, so this Schwarzschild action that we can uh, derive from this uh, one plus one dimensional gravity th theory uh, basically realizes and captures very many aspects of at least the low energy dynamics of the SVFSYK model. Now this is not a talk about the SYK model, but it's good to keep in mind this motivation as, as we go along. Um, and one reason for us to be interested in this connection to the SYK model is that these, um, as we heard in uh, the uh, talk by uh, Jefferson in the parallel sessions, uh, actually defining the quantum complexity for a quantum field theory is, is not entirely straightforward. And at least in the SYK model where we have discrete uh, field variables, the, the fermions, and they have uh, Q-local interactions with Q um, uh, basically bounded, um, we should have a better chance of having a, a well-defined notion of quantum complexity. And then it's interesting to, to explore that in, the, in this dual setting. So that's the motivation. Um, so what I'll do, I will first just um, run quickly through what this Jack Cave Teitelboin model is. It was studied quite a while ago by um, uh, Jack Cave and, and Teitelboin, I believe, separately. Uh, as a basically a very simple but still non-trivial uh, example of a, so it's a toy model for gravity. Um, the action 
is the following, and let's sort of look at it term by term. So it has a, it's a dilaton gravity theory, so it has a scalar field, the dilaton, and then it has just two-dimensional gravity. Um, and this is, um, so it's, it is linear in the dilaton here, the action, and then this is a bulk term, there is then a boundary term that one adds to have a well-posed uh, variational problem for the gravitational theory. And then this last term here is a counter term that one adds, as we'll see soon, is that it's, this theory has ADS, is, the geometry is locally ADS, and so one needs, uh, one can in fact get, uh, if one includes this term, one gets, uh, when one evaluates the Euclidean action, one gets finite, well-defined uh, quantities, which we will look at in a minute. Uh, now, in this recent work on this model, it's, uh, people usually add this extra term here, which involves just a constant in front, and then there is this topological term here, which is proportional to the Euler characteristic of your two-dimensional manifold. And this will play an important role in, in, in what follows. Uh, now, a priori, from the one plus one dimension you know, point of view, you might say, well, why, why do I need to add this? It's clearly, it uh, doesn't contribute to the dynamics. But we'll see that it's, it, it will give important contributions to the thermodynamics of the black holes that we study. And furthermore, uh, to get a little bit, to, to uh, look a little bit ahead, what I will find is that this model on its own as a one plus one dimensional theory is actually not going to be able to um, give us, or the, these conjectures are not going to be uh, realized in that, that case. You need actually to remember its heritage, that is, this model can be derived by dimensional reduction, basically by spherical reduction. Um, so usually it's, one starts in three plus one dimensions, but one can in fact do it. It doesn't really matter how many dimensions one starts in. Um, and so we will come back to that as well. Now, of course, the field equations of this model are very simple, in particular because the, the uh, scalar field comes in linear and it comes in without derivatives, you get basically as a constraint that the geometry has to be ADS2. And then you have the Einstein equation then actually gives you some conditions on the dilaton field. And I'll mostly be using what are called global coordinates on the ADS2 in this talk. Um, well, I'll also introduce uh, Schwarzschild type coordinates for, the, for my black hole in a bit. And in this coordinate system, well, of course, it's a two-dimensional metric, so it's conformal to a flat metric. And the conformal factor here blows up at sigma equal to zero and sigma equal to pi. So that's the asymptotic, two asymptotics of the ADS2. And then it um, has a characteristic length scale, which I will leave undetermined for the time being. So that's the two-dimensional ADS scale, which once we do the spherical reduction, we will relate to the variables of the higher dimensional theory. Okay. And it's also easy to see that one has a one-parameter family of solutions for the dilaton field. And uh, in anticipation of, of the black hole interpretation of this, uh, I have the parameter I put in front here is, is I call phi h, which refers to it is, will turn out to be the value of the dilaton at the horizon. And uh, so this is basically it. I've solved solved my uh, field equation. So in what sense is there, a, is there a black hole here? Well, for that, we need to look a little bit more closely at this, this dilaton field. And we do that here. So this is just the same solution written again over here. And this is also the same Penrose diagram. By the way, yeah, the Penrose diagram is such that uh, what I'm really looking at here is the uh, covering space of the ADS. So the my time variable goes from minus infinity to infinity, but the way to study black holes in this theory is that you break the ADS to symmetry by introducing a boundary. And so we introduce some boundary value of the dilaton, which will be, uh, has to be um, sort of a large value, but still it's small compared to this phi zero that I had, which was the thing that multiplied the topological term. Now, the reason I want that is because when you look at this uh, solution, you'll see that the, if I take 
nu larger than pi over 2, that is, I go above this line here, this dilaton field will actually go negative. And um, again, anticipating where I'm going to get this theory from, which is from a higher dimensional reduction, the full dilaton field, that is the sum of this constant and the uh, jacket title point field, is in fact has the interpretation as the area of the transverse two-sphere in my dimensional reduction. So that area has, for, for physical uh, configurations, had better be positive. And so we will declare that if that goes to zero here, um, then I have a singularity. And those singularities are sitting here. Now, of course, this, is, this Penrose diagram is now very reminiscent, obviously, of a uh, Reisen and Ostrom Penrose diagram in higher dimension. That's not a coincidence, of course, because this is a dimensional reduction of that, as we will see in a minute. OK. Now, this, actually, this thing here is a sort of a, a proxy for the Reisen and Ostrom singularity. It's actually not quite the same thing. The reason is that this reduction to the jacquive teitelbaum theory is only going to be true, or only going to be valid, if this is a small fluctuation compared to the phi zero, which, of course, is not the case when it cancels it. Uh, but nevertheless, it is an approximation to a theory, as we will see explicitly, where there is indeed a singularity where this transverse area goes to zero. So we will leave it at that and just uh, work, call this a singularity. And therefore, these two will then be event horizons. This is the outer horizon. Here is the inner horizon that I will have. And then this repeats on upwards. OK. So that's the black hole. But now I'm going to want to refer to uh, this complexity and how it evolves in time. And then I have to ask, what, what is the time variable that I want to use? And that is the time variable is, uh, that one wants is the time of the boundary theory. And that is, as usual, going to be uh, related to some asymptotic Schwarzschild time. Um, now, we can write our ADS2 space uh, in basically this blackening factor here, as long as it is a quadratic function of R, it satisfies the equations of motion. It's going to be locally ADS. And so we simply basically are following Kitaev here, and we simply write it in this form. In this coordinate system, one finds that the dilaton is actually a linear function of R, so that's nice. And so the event horizon is by construction at this value here. Now, one can do the standard construction, go to the Euclidean section to see the uh, temperature, and then one finds that it's proportional to RH. Now, of course, this, has, this system has an underlying scaling symmetry, the ADS2 symmetry, which is th this one up here. And if I do this scaling here, and I'd simultaneously scale my uh, very RH variable, then, of course, this is an isometry of, the, of this metric. What that means is that this, because of the scaling symmetry there, this temperature um, or the scale here is not really physically meaningful. And one needs either just to work with scale invariant uh, combinations of variables, which is of course fine and one can do. And what we'll find also as a byproduct of this spherical reduction is that that actually will fix a scale. As soon as we refer this two-dimensional system to the higher dimensional system that from where it came, we actually will find that we can fix this uh, scaling in, in a very natural way. OK. And now, but since I'm going to be working with my solution in global time, I want to know what is the relationship. And this is actually a simple enough thing that you can just do the Kruskal extension very explicitly. Everything is analytic. And what I'm really interested in is the relationship as I move along this boundary here, as nu goes from, let's say we start here at zero in global time, and we go up to pi over two, how does the Schwarzschild time um, change? And that's actually along this boundary. We're assuming that it's close to R going to infinity here. Then this is uh, a very good approximation. And one finds in particular that, as you expect, of course, that as t goes to infinity, nu doesn't evolve beyond. It sort of gets stuck up here. So that's all as it should be. OK. So that's our geometry. This is our black two-dimensional black hole. And now we're going to see to use it. Uh, now, one more thing I want to do is I, I'm going to, for future reference, I'm going to actually think about the thermodynamic variable. So I go to the Euclidean solution. 
And then the ADS2 is going to be a disk. And I can calculate basically my on-shell Euclidean action, the terms that I had, the bulk term plus the boundary term. And it'll give me the following answers for the uh, on-shell action. I will get something that is, I can interpret as an entropy, and I'll get a mass term. And these are explicit formulas that I get for this. In particular, this system has a zero temperature entropy. Uh, well, that's uh, good because at zero temperature, it should go to a, an extremal black hole. But also, on the, if we're thinking about some approximate duality to SYK, we also know that there is a, at least an entropy that persists to very low temperatures there. OK. So, that, yeah. No, the orange line was the boundary. The singularity was the was what's supposed to be a fuzzy black line, because it was. <laughs> Here's the singularity. Uh, maybe I should have made it more fuzzy. Sorry. Uh, that's to indicate that the singularity is sort of roughly in that region. We don't know exactly where it is, in, you know, using these variables, but there is a time-like singularity there. Okay. So. The important thing to note, as was note, has been noted by many authors before us, of course, is that the, extreme, the entropy beyond the extremal value grows linearly in temperature. The mass goes quadratic, goes like t squared, and the usual thermodynamic relation here is, uh, is uh, satisfied. So this also is a good check. So now we want to do start checking these conjectures. Now, I'm not going to go into any details on, the, on this, but basically the motivation behind these conjectures is, goes back, can be traced back to the work of uh, Hayden and Preskill, who suggested as sort of as a toy model for the non-local scrambling dynamics that uh, uh, black hole complementarity says must take place when you get near to a black hole horizon. They modeled that with a, with a quantum circuit. And basically, with that circuit, to get the black hole uh, physics, you make the number of qubits in the circuit uh, of order of the number of uh, degrees of freedom, which is the, so the number of degrees of freedom should be give you the proportional to the entropy. Um, and you use a universal set of uh, some primitive gates, so those are basically unitary operations that act on some restricted set of these qubits, a uh, finite number of them at a time. And then the quantum complexity of a state of the circuit is the minimum number of these primitive gates that you need to apply in order to get to that state from some given reference state. Now, of course, this is far from a universal definition. It, it relies on a, on a reference state, and, 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 and um, also it relies you know, can, of course, you can imagine using different gate sets. And, uh, um, but the important thing is that we're mostly interested in this, prop this quantity, um, this complexity as it evolves in time. And so the dependence of the, um, of the, for example, reference state is believed not to affect, let's say, the time derivative of the um, complexity as, uh, you know, at, at late times. So we're going to, uh, but any, mostly what one, what I wanted to get from this, this, this sort of um, uh, quantum circuit picture is that if we assume that each qubit gets acted on by at, one, at least at most one gate per cycle in the circuit, uh, then basically the change in the complexity in that cycle should be of order the number of those gates that act, and that is basically the number of pairs, let's say, or, or, or some finite clusters of, of these, so it will be proportional to the entropy. Now, if we further assume, as Hayden and Preskill did, that each cycle takes of order one unit of Rindler time, what this tells us is that, since the Rindler time is related to the Schwarzschild time by a factor of the temperature, it tells us that we expect the time derivative with respect to Schwarzschild time of this quantity to be a constant, and that constant should on the one hand be proportional to the temperature, and, and on the other hand it should be proportional to the entropy of the system. So let's see if we can get that to work. Now these two conjectures that I want to 
try out here are first the complexity equals volume from, from uh, Susskind, where he conjectures that the complexity is, and I'm not going to go into the uh, motivation for it here, I uh, don't have time for that, but it's basically you calculate, if this is here, here there's a Penrose diagram for a, a two-sided ADS black hole, and you calculate the uh, volume of the sort of part of, so you imagine two uh, slice, time slice that goes from boundary between the boundaries, uh, you basically maximize the volume of that slice. You, you, you find the slice sort of slate of hand calculation that Lenny suggested. Uh, he can't even himself explain why it works, but it always does. And it also gives the same answer. So, but I'm not going to go into that here. So this looks, uh, doesn't look so promising. So what, what to do? And the point is that this is actually now it's not that this fails, but one has to be a little bit careful. Uh, it, well, if you restrict to this one plus one dimensional theory per se, and don't take it sort of embedded into a higher dimensional context, then it simply is failing. But maybe that's not the, what you want to do. So let me very quickly show you how, how this gets resolved. So this theory that we're talking about, this is the effective description along this long throat of a near extremal black hole. Yeah. So we'll do this very quickly now. In one minute, I'm going to do this dimensional reduction. Now, of course, I don't really, I mean, this is a standard thing. You've, you've seen it before. It's done quite nicely in this paper by Navarro Salas and Navarro. So you simply insert an ansatz of this form into your four-dimensional theory. You work out what your action gets, and you get. The important thing is that the action, of course, will include a kinetic it will involve, include a, a gauge field. So I'm not yet at the Jacquive tidal point theory here. So then what one does is one looks at the equations of motion. One sees that the Maxwell equation is very simple. One eliminates the gauge field, plugs it into the other equations, and then you get these very nice equations here that you can now expand around the value of the dilaton at the horizon. And sure enough, you get these Jacquive tidal point equations. Okay. And uh, so that's fine. And now the question is, can we actually get this action by integrating out the gauge field and considering the near horizon limit? And the answer is yes, but not quite directly. And the reason is that we've eliminated a dynamical variable that has kinetic energy. We've integrated it out in favor of a potential energy. If you do that at the level of the action, you're always going to get the wrong sign for the effective action term. So you need to fix that by adding a boundary term. And that actually turns out that it's exactly the same boundary term that you would add anyway to take your ensemble from fixed chemical potential to fixed charge. So what we're finding is that the Jackie tidal boy model is actually Reisner Nordstrom physics near in, in the near horizon limit of a near extremal Reisner Nordstrom in an ensemble that is at fixed charge. Now, and maybe we shouldn't be surprised that that's not giving us a reasonable answer for, on this Wheeler DeWitt patch, because the Wheeler DeWitt boundaries are not real physical boundaries. They, you know, there's no reason why you should constrain charge to be fixed in there. And indeed, if you add the boundary term that you do to get the Jackie title bone, so basically you add this boundary term, you work out its contribution to the action, and it precisely flips the sign back to how you want it to be. And therefore, the action, remaining action for the dilaton is now going to give you the right behaviors. And let me skip over that. You can also work out the thermodynamics, and you find that at fixed charge, you recover precisely the sort of formulas that you had for, for uh, the, uh, the 2D theory. So in fact, the thermodynamics is also telling you this is a fixed charge example. And furthermore, as promised, you actually do get to fix your uh, scaling. Basically, the, the four-dimensional Planck length gives you the reference scale that you wanted. Now you do this, you reduce this term that you, so to get Jackie title bomb, you added a term. So let's not add that term. So we undo the adding of the term to get to calculate. So the actual calculation we should do is the following. You take Jackie title bond, which didn't give us, and then you add the term that um, you flip the sign back. And when you do, you very nicely get that the whole story works out. So basically, the bottom line is that both of these conjectures can be made to work, but not all actions are equal. Um, thank you.
So thank you very much for that nice talk. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Yes. So I guess since you, they both work, uh, the ultimate goal should be to compare it to some calculation that can distinguish the two. I mean, either a field theory calculation or otherwise. Have you have any thoughts on that? Sure, we would love to do that. But we, have, we have not. No, no. I mean, that, this was supposed to be a, a warm-up exercise for that calculation. Uh, we're just getting warm. You know, it's been a few months, but uh, who knows? Uh, so, no, no. That, this is where we want to go with this, or one of the places. Now, I had a second part to the whole story, which I think I'm quite glad now that I decided last night not even to try to talk about, um, where, again, these, the fact that you have a charged black hole comes into place. This has to do with how operators grow you know, in, in this scrambling dynamics. And there, we actually have some prediction that can, doesn't actually need SYK calculations, but can also be tested already at the Swatchian level. So we have a prediction for the early time behavior of the out of time order uh, correlation function which also we would love to work out, but it's actually a little bit, there's some regularization issues there that we haven't sorted out yet. Any further questions? Oh, yes. A uh, simple one. Uh, so when you move further along the time axis, I guess it's uh, okay. not from uh, uh, causality structure, is there anything noticeable happen when you enter sort of your next sector of white and black holes? Well, I mean, this Einstein-Rosen bridge is getting bigger and bigger. And it keeps going. And of course, if you, I think if you very, you know, if you really extend time, you know, beyond exponential and actually take double exponential times, you do expect, so first after an exponential uh, time, the quantum complexity will, will level off. And then you will start seeing recurrences on um, these double exponential times. And obviously, these classical geometry cannot capture that because it just continues growing forever. So there's absolutely, there's going to be very interesting physics that this sort of semi-classical picture cannot capture. That's right. One final question. Uh, so I'm wondering, with this extra term that you added to the action, is, uh, is the Schwarzschild action still an effective action in the yes. IR? Good, good point. Um, the point is that I'm adding a boundary term, and it doesn't affect the local dynamics. So the Swatchian action you get, it actually governs the, you know, the dynamics of fluctuations in this background. And so those are, and it's true, of course, the Swatchian is non-local on the, on the boundary, but this term that I'm adding does not affect this. So, so we're not at all claiming that the, the, that the calculations that people have done using the Jackie Tidalboin theory to date are, are, are wrong, and you know, but we're just saying that the model as it usually stands, this is, this does not capture the uh, the complexity growth. And so you need this. To, you need to sort of go back to its uh, origins for that. Okay. In the interest of keeping things going, since we started a little late, I think we should leave further questions for the coffee breaks. Uh, but please give our speaker uh, another round of applause.